I invite you, if you would, to begin our time, and we'll be flipping around quite a bit, but go ahead and open your Bibles just to start as a uh, launching place to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I'll probably have you leave that in a moment. But the reason for that is I'm taking a little break this morning from the Gospel of John, only because next week we have our wonderful one-year anniversary. The following week, I'll be out of town at another brother's church, North Lake Bible Church, visiting them. And I didn't feel right about starting the, uh, uh, John 3 and then stopping. I felt like I was going to make God stutter. So we will start John 3 in a couple weeks, and we'll be three or four sermons in there. As for today, there's a topic I want to talk to you about that I think is very important. And what I want to talk about today is the doctrine of repentance. I want to talk about the doctrine of repentance. What does it mean to understand repentance and apply repentance? You know, it's interesting, in the year of 1517, many of you know the, the former monk and German reformer Martin Luther penned the 95 Thesis, which is largely about indulgences in the Roman Catholic Church and he pinned that to the Wittenberg Church doors there of Castle Church of the 95 Thesis. But sometimes we don't realize that within that, it wasn't just an assault on Roman Catholicism. He actually felt the need to teach the church about the doctrine of repentance. He even says there a statement about when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith, then the life of a believer, having Jesus as our Lord and Savior, is to be characterized by repentance. Luther says, repentance is not just a one-time action in salvation. Repentance is a way of life. Repentance is a way of life. And that's why I want to talk about it today. Because it's one of those areas that if you've hung around the church long enough, you're probably aware, as well as I am, that it's always under attack. Why wouldn't Satan want to attack the doctrine of repentance? Just think about it. In true believers... If he can confuse their understanding of what it truly means to turn from sin for the glory of Christ, he can make the gospel look awfully ugly if a believer that professes to follow him still lives in constant patterns of unrepentant sin. So he loves to confuse the doctrine of repentance even for believers. And then unbelievers, fall fakes and phonies and pretenders and people that are self-deceived, of course he doesn't want them to understand repentance. Because faith and repentance are both part and parcel of what God does in salvation. So if you can get a pretender or a false convert or a phony, someone self-deceived, to think they know Christ but live a life of unrepentance, never coming to a true place of repentance before God, well, Satan loves that. He can leave them self-deceived all the way to hell. And in my experience, for whatever reason, probably because the attacks on true doctrine over the last 50 years or so, specifically in the church, on what it means happens when God saves you and he becomes Lord of your life. There's been this attack on the doctrine of repentance, and it seems sometimes even well-meaning, godly people that love the Lord are very clear on a whole lot of areas in the Christian life, but then you start talking about repentance and real and true repentance, and even wonderful people that love the Lord are a little fuzzy on this doctrine. And so what I want to do is take some time today and establish what I hope for all of us is a clear understanding of what our Bible teaches about repentance, both in salvation and repentance in sanctification, the ongoing work that God's doing in our lives. So just some introductory thoughts about repentance as we think about it. We should remember, first off, as you think about it, that repentance was a major preaching of Scripture, Old and New Testament. Think about John the Baptist for a moment. John the Baptist comes on the scene and his message is what? A message of repentance. Matthew 3, 2. Repent. That's his first sermon. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then a few verses later, John says, and if your repentance is genuine, it will have feet. It will have life. It won't just be your lips. There'll be fruit. And he says, therefore, bear fruit, Matthew 3, 8, in keeping with repentance. Not only that, we sometimes forget that when we follow the Lord Jesus in Matthew and Mark's gospel, immediately Jesus comes on the scene and his first sermons are about repentance. Matthew 4, 17. Here's what Matthew says. Jesus begins his preaching ministry and he says, here's the first words of Jesus' preaching ministry, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
And then Mark in his gospel, he can't even get past verse 15 of chapter 1 before he says, And Jesus comes on the scene and says, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. There's our Lord's preaching ministry when he begins. Not only John the Baptist and our Lord, but also the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul summarizes his entire ministry to Jews and Gentiles in Acts 20, 21. And here's what he says. I did not shrink from declaring to you everything, the whole counsel of God, that which would profit you, that I could teach you. And listen, publicly and house to house. So Paul's about to say, here was my public preaching ministry, and here's my discipleship and counseling ministry. House to house and from the pulpit, here was my ministry. You ready for it? 21, that I was solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There it is. Repentance and faith. And then let's not forget the Old Testament. You can't hardly read an Old Testament prophet with him not preaching about repentance. For example, Hosea 14, 1 and 2. Ready? Repent, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take these words in your mouth and repent and say to the Lord, take our iniquity, Lord, and receive us graciously that we may present the fruit of our lips. We say with our mouth that we're confessing our sin and we want our lives to turn from sin as a mark of true repentance. Now this is key. If you heard in those passages a few different times, Paul said, repentance from sin and faith in God. Or the prophet Hosea says, repenting from your sin and turning towards God. And I'm going to show you a bunch of passages today. And you need to understand that repentance is not about turning from sin to self, turning from sin to good works, turning from sin to other circumstances. Repentance is about turning from sin to God. That's very different. Turning from sin to righteousness, turning from idols to truth, turning from lies and deceptions to the holiness of Christ. Repentance is about turning from sin, not to self, not to circumstances, not to good works. It's turning to God. It's very important. Here's why that's key. There's been this silly teaching in America the last 50 years that goes along the lines something like this. Well, if we teach people that repentance is required for salvation, we're teaching them works. But I ask you, beloved, if repentance is the doctrine that teaches you to turn from sin to God, then embedded in repentance is faith. Because in repentance, you're believing what God says about your sin. That's faith. And then in faith, you know that the only remedy for your sin is to turn to God to save you from it and forgive you of your sin. So when you read repentance in the scripture or you read faith, they are two sides of the same coin. Because in repentance, you're believing God. That's faith. And in faith, if you come in true faith, you turn from sin to God in faith. Faith and repentance are two sides of the same coin. So let's talk about this word group for repentance for a little bit. And let's talk about it old and new so you understand it. Repentance is the word in the Old Testament, shuv. It means to turn. It quite literally means to do a 180. So when you read repentance, what you're reading is a turn, a turning from sin to God in righteousness, a turning from idolatry to God's truth. It's a 180. That's the Old Testament word, shuv. New Testament, you get the Greek word, not the Hebrew word shuv, New Testament Greek word metanoia, which means to have a change of mind that leads to a change of actions. There's a change in your thinking, in your habits, in your behavior, in your life, in your heart, and you go the other direction. It also means 180. Metanoia. So both Old and New Testament, repentance has the idea of turning from sin to God. Turning from idolatry to God's forgiveness. Turning from lies to truth. Turning from unholiness to holiness. So keep that in your mind. And it's really key because repentance then has the idea of not just something you confess with your mouth only. Not just something you think in your mind, but an actual turning of your life away from sin towards righteousness. So that means some things. Repentance is more than just good intentions. Repentance is more than just being convicted. Repentance is more than just confession. Repentance is actually turning from specific sins to righteousness. Actually turning from your sins to God. 
And I think it's helpful for a second, now that I've established that the repentance idea has the idea of turning away from sin to God, to maybe break up repentance in maybe three different categories. This is going to be helpful for us. So if you want to take the doctrine of repentance and spread it across the scope of scripture, you could say this, repentance involves conviction, repentance involves confession, and repentance involves turning from sin. Now, sometimes the Bible just says repent, and it includes you being convicted over your sin, you confessing your sin, and you turning from your sin. But there's other times the scripture actually breaks those out And you see people that are convicted over their sin, confessing their sin, but they never truly repent. So you can actually have conviction and confession and never come to true repentance. But in true repentance, you always have true conviction and true confession. Let me say it again. You can be convicted over your sin, confess your sin, and never truly come to repentance. But in true repentance, a turning, you are first convicted, and then you confess, and then you turn from your sin. So the the repentance idea of going the other direction. So let me prove that from Scripture a little bit. I stated it to you, so let me prove it to you. So in repentance, as we think about it, we've got three categories. You've got conviction, confession, and you've got the repentance, the turning from it. So here's what we could say about that. A person then, as I've shown you in a couple passages, cannot truly be saved unless they've had true repentance. You cannot be a Christian if you've never had a moment in your life where you came to grips with your sin, realized that you've offended a holy God, and in conviction over that sin that the Spirit does in your heart, you confess to God your sinfulness, and you confess your need for Christ, and you put your faith in your only hope being Jesus Christ the righteous one, dead buried, risen, and you trust in him by faith, that moment right there is what happens in conversion. That is a moment of repentance. So if you said, I don't know if I've never repented in my life, well, then you're not saved. But if you have, if you are in Christ, at some moment in your life, you've had true repentance where there's a radical redirection from a life pursuing sin to a life pursuing Christ, a life sprinting towards hell to a life sprinting towards God's glory. There is a radical life altering 180 and that's a divine work and it's a human work. Let me show this to you. Turn over to 2 Timothy 2.24. Repentance in conversion has a divine side to it and it has a human dimension to it. And we live in the tensions of scripture and we worship God as he lays them before us. So notice, here's the divine side of what God does to grant us repentance. Repentance is required of us, but it must be granted by our Lord. 2 Timothy 2.24. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness, Correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps, don't miss this, 2 Timothy 2.25, God may grant them repentance. There it is. God gift them repentance. And that gifting of repentance, notice, leads to the knowledge of the truth. And what is happening in that gifting of repentance? Well, it is the full recovery from satanic influence. And that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been held captive to do his will. So when we think about repentance, we must realize there is a divine side of repentance. God must grant that to us. However, you go to other passages, and the same author here, who said that in 2 Timothy, Paul, turn over to 1 Thessalonians, he gives you the human dimension of repentance. And remember, conviction confession, repentance. Sometimes they're spread out, sometimes they're all together. I want you to notice you're going to see conviction and confession and a turning in this passage. You're going to see everything happen in Thessalonica. Notice, here's the human dimension. So think about these tensions in scripture. God requires we have faith and he gives us the gift of faith. God requires that we repent of our sin, but he gives us the ability to repent. If we don't repent and we don't have faith, we're responsible. If we do have true faith and repentance, it's the mercy of God. This is the beautiful tension of scripture. Notice the human dimension now of repentance. And now you're going to see conviction language, some confession language, and turning language. Paul is speaking in 1 Thessalonians 1 
about the conversion of a bunch of godless, self-worshipping, idol-worshipping Gentiles. And notice what he says. Verse 5, 1 Thessalonians 1. For our gospel, the good news of Christ, did not come to you in word only, but in power of the Holy Spirit. There it is. So the Holy Spirit shows up, and notice what the Holy Spirit brings. Conviction. There's that first word I brought you. And the Holy Spirit shows up with conviction. Okay? And then he goes on to talk about the work God's doing in their life. And now skip down to verses 8 and 9. So they got convicted, and now we see they confessed and repented. Verse 8. Here's the human dimension. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Notice, the word of God has gone forth, for they report about us what kind of reception we had with you. And notice, here's repentance language, how you turned to God, notice, from idols. You don't just turn from idols, you turn from your sin to God to find mercy and forgiveness, faith and repentance conviction, they were confessing their sinfulness, and they turned to God for forgiveness. Now, you may ask the question, and I stated a little bit bit ago, but it's important to state again, do we have illustrations in scripture where we have people convicted over sin, confessing sin, but never truly turning from their sin and repentance? We do. In fact, turn to 1 Samuel 15. I'll show you a man who became convicted He confessed, but he never wanted to give up his sin. It was still too precious to him. 1 Samuel 15. Turn there, if you would. Now, what what you are not knowing coming to this point, unless you're pretty uh, accustomed to reading 1 Samuel, is a couple chapters ago in 1 Samuel, Saul started royally blowing it. Saul's appointed king over Israel. Saul's given the reins to lead the nation. The people want a king. God gives him this handsome, charming, tall, wonderful, so-called leader. But by the time you get to chapter 15, Saul's basically royally blown it. He's going to lose his kingdom. He's living for his sin and his own vices and desires. He's putting things, idols in the high places to worship himself. And Samuel shows up in 1 Samuel 15, and God sends him, and God says, I want you to go confront Saul for his lack of obedience. And so Samuel confronts Saul. Saul lies. Saul covers. Saul tries to deceive. Saul tries to get Samuel off his back, and Samuel keeps pressing in like a good brother. Finally, Saul sees that I am exposed. I am caught. There's no way to cover my lies anymore. And that's when you get to verse 22, Samuel said, of 1 Samuel 15, Has the Lord have much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, Saul. You're trying to give all these sacrifices to the Lord, but you're living in unrepentance. Now verse 23, For rebellion is the sin of divination, and insubordination is an iniquity and idolatry. Notice this, Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he is rejecting you from being king. Now Saul has nowhere else to turn. He's been exposed as a fake. And then notice Saul. Then Saul says to Samuel, I've sinned. I've indeed transgressed the command of the Lord and your words. Notice, because I was a man fear. Because I feared the people and listened to their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. Now where does he say, Return with me too. Well, you're going to see in a moment, he wants Samuel to come back to the battlefield with him where he's exposed as a hypocrite so Samuel can help him manage the outcome and clear his reputation. Saul doesn't care about God's glory. Saul's trying to manage his own earthly reputation. And watch what Samuel says to him, verse 26. I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord. You're thinking, wait, but he had a confession. He called it sin. But as a prophet, Samuel knew he was a fake He was maybe convicted, he's now confessing, but he's not truly repenting and turning from his sin. Notice, 26, you've rejected the word of the Lord and the the Lord has rejected you from being king. And Samuel turned to go and now you see a desperate, unrepentant man full of his guilt. Saul seized the edge of his robe and it tore. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor, which is David, who is better than you. I mean, that would have stung. 
Also, the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that she should change his mind. Saul says again, then he says, I have sinned. Confession, there it is. Honor me now before the elders. That's all he cares about. Clear my earthly reputation, Samuel. Come back with me as a prophet and let people know I'm still good to be king. He doesn't care about God's glory, God's honor, his sin against the Lord in heaven. All he cares about is managing the outcome. Saul is convicted, he's confessing, but he's totally unrepentant. No, no. Samuel goes back, if you know the rest of the story, and hacks Agag to pieces and exposes that Saul's a hypocrite. Well, we know Saul's not repentant because in about a, two chapters from now, he's got spear in his hand trying to pin David to a wall and murder him. Then a few chapters later, he's full of bitterness and anger and rage, hunting David like he's a dog. And then after that, he has the equivalent of what we would call witchcraft, going and worshiping before a witch to try and uh, appease his guilty conscience. And then he basically dies in battle, unrepentant, shaking his fist at God. Convicted, confessing, totally unrepentant. There's one illustration. Turn to Proverbs 28, 13. Let me show you this in the Proverbs. Proverbs 28, 13. Keep those categories in your mind. Conviction, confession, and repentance is the actual turning. Proverbs 28, 13. Notice what Solomon says here. Very interesting language. He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper. So he who lies, covers, minimizes, doesn't own sin, doesn't confess sin. He who lies and tries to keep his sin hidden, he will not prosper. But notice he doesn't say, but he who uncovers his sin will prosper. No, 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 no. He says, but he who confesses, and then we have repentance language. You have confession and repentance. Notice, he who confesses and owns his sin, so you got conviction, confession, and then repent, Old Testament repentance language, and forsakes his sin, he will find compassion. You know what that word for forsake is? It literally has the idea of putting a stake in the ground, hammering it in, and walking away from it. You want to know who finds God's compassion? Not just the confessor, not just the convicted one with good intentions, but the one that actually turns from their sin to God runs from their unrighteousness, abandons their evil ways, and pursues God's glory. Notice it. You can conceal and have no compassion, but you confess and you still don't forsake. The text doesn't say you find God's compassion. And by the way, compassion there doesn't only mean forgiveness of sin. It means empowerment to overcome sin. When the Spirit saves us, He takes up residency in our heart and grants us forgiveness of sin, and we are, we are bought and paid for. Our salvation can never be lost. It is secure. There is no condemnation. But the Spirit is not only a saving Spirit and a forgiving Spirit, but an empowering Spirit. Notice what it says there. This is, this is language for, for finding God's favor as you pursue righteousness. He who conceals will not prosper. But he who uncovers their sin confesses and wants to leave it behind and put a stake in the ground and repent of their sin and go the other direction, he will find compassion. He'll find favor with God. Saving favor, sanctifying favor, sustaining, stabilizing favor from God. So you've got it broken out there. Conviction, confession, and then repentance. Now turn to Hebrews 12, 14 to 17. Let me show you one more. That was illustrative from the Proverbs, but let me show you, like Saul, Esau. Esau sought repentance with tears, and he found no repentance. Hebrews 12, verses 14 to 17. Notice this, Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue peace with all men, and sanctification without with which no one will see the Lord. You couldn't be more clear in that. A believer is a person pursuing sanctification, holy living, period. And see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness spring up causing trouble and by, by it many are defiled. And then he illustrates it. That there may be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. You know the story of uh, Esau giving up his entire future for a single moment of hedonistic passion to his brother. 
And notice, Esau sought repentance, but Esau's repentance, his conviction, his confession, his seeking of repentance, it wasn't genuine. He didn't really want to turn from his sin for God's glory. He was all concerned about his earthly consequences and losing the blessing. Notice 17. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. Esau had worldly sorrow. Esau had worldly grief. Esau was upset that the circumstances weren't going his way. He wasn't concerned that he had offended the Lord of glory. He just wanted his birthright back. Conviction, confession, no repentance. No true granting of a changed heart. So, let me try and summarize a couple things, and then we're going to turn the corner here, and I think it'll be more practical for you. Man's only hope is in Jesus Christ and Christ alone and hope in the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Turning from your sin to Christ and God saves a person. Absolutely the full payment for sin. In true salvation, repentance is always there because the person becomes brand new. The things they used to love, they now hate. The things they used to hate, they now love. The sin they used to live in, they now run from. The friendships they used to just hang out with and love to live in, they now flee for godly friendships. The selfishness they used to pursue for self, they now pursue for Christ. It is a radical re-altering and a redirection in life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, he's new. Repentance shows up. It may be incremental. It may be uh, growing. But there's going to be a radical change of direction in conversion. So a person without repentance cannot be a true Christian. Now, we know that's true from Scripture. I've documented it. You can go to places like Luke 13, 5, where Jesus says, Repent or you will perish. I've shown you other passages, but here's what I want you to think about. While that is absolutely true, that we cannot be saved without true repentance and true confession and true brokenness before the Lord, it is also possible that after God saves us by the mercy of the cross of Christ, after God grants us faith and repentance, after we fall before his mercy and we receive a new heart and we have a changed life, believers... While we cannot have shallow repentance to be saved, we can certainly have a lot of shallow repentance after God saves us. You see, here's what happens, I think. We are so grateful for the grace of the gospel. We're so grateful for forgiven sin, and God saves us, and there's a radical re-altering of our direction, and now we're pursuing Christ. And there's, in our sin nature, there is something in us so quickly just becomes presumptuous on the blood of the cross. We become so casual about the sin that we were saved from. We become so complacent. And I think sometimes even in good churches, we almost become conditioned to receive conviction. You know how it is. Oh, man, great sermon. I'm so convicted. And then I confess that. And then I go into my week and I never turn in repentance and actually start pursuing the opposite of what I was pursuing. I actually convinced myself that conviction and confession was true repentance. But actually, I may have been true in the conviction. John 16, 8, what's the scripture say? The Spirit's convicting of sin, righteousness, and judgment. There you go. In John's gospel, a call for repentance. The Spirit convicts of sin, righteousness, judgment. That's all the time, beloved. We're always under conviction. Unbelievers are under conviction and they suppress it. Believers are under conviction and we're responding to it. Conviction comes from the word. But we get convicted and then we think, oh, I'm going to confess. I need to own that sin. And I go to passages on confession and I confess it. But repentance then, in that confession we come and we receive God's forgiveness and we're thankful for the gospel. But repentance is that ending of it where your conviction and your confession gets feet and you actually turn from your sin and do a 180 and go the other direction. But what we'll do is we'll go, I was convicted, I confessed, and then we don't do a 180, we do a 360. And we go right back to the sin that God just exposed us to. We go right back to the thing that we are confessing. We don't actually ever turn and go the other direction. You know what we're like? I'll tell you what we're like. And I'm just as guilty as the rest of you at times. Proverbs 26, 11, Like a dog that returns to its vomit is a fool that repeats his folly. Like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool that repeats his folly. Dear ones, 
we have to be so careful that we don't redefine the doctrine of repentance because it's kind of cathartic. It makes us feel a little bit better. Well, I was convicted and I confessed, but I'm right back to my same sin. Look, in your confession, if you're genuine, you know the power of the gospel, the forgiveness of sins. 1 John 1, 9, we confess our sin and he's faithful and righteous to forgive us. Conviction, if it's coming from the Lord, that's from him, that's true. But the ending of the doctrine of repentance is, are you actually going into your life in the areas you're convicted of and you're confessing and working to turn from sin to God, working to turn from lies to truth, working to turn from wickedness to righteousness? Are you actually going and turning from your sin? That's repentance, the full expression of it. I'll give you another layer of this. You know what we do? It's even worse sometimes. We get convicted. We confess to the Lord, and then we think, I'm going to tell a friend. I'm going to go get some prayer requests for this. And in the spirit of James 5, we go tell a friend, hey, I need to talk to you about some sin I'm struggling with. Praise the Lord. Confess your sin to one another. That's great. And then you leave there, and you think, man, I feel good. I got that release off my back. I confess my sin to my brother. And then I just go right back to it. You just treated your friend like they were a Catholic priest. You just replace the priest with a friend. That's why people go to confession. It's a cathartic release. I feel guilty for my sin. I go to the confession. I tell the priest, I'm so sorry about my sin. Absolve me of my guilt. Now I can go back to my sin. We do this with friends. And we almost become comfortable. We get like this Teflon around us. We get this residue that gets in this flow of conviction and confession, conviction and confession. And then you look at our life and you think, but am I turning from those things that the Spirit keeps mercifully convicting me of? I mean, Romans 2, 4, it is the kindness and mercy and patience of God that leads you to repentance. Don't think lightly of it. Romans 2, 4. I was uh, in a little Q&A gathering with a bunch of pastors recently at the Truth and Love Conference, and I was so convicted about areas of shallow repentance in my life because I was sitting there, and I was listening to Andrew Quigley, and I won't try and butcher his accent, but he's Irish, and then he's Scottish. You know, I won't do any more. But, but he got this brogue accent. I don't know what the voice of the Lord sounds like. I've never heard him audibly, but I feel like it would be Scottish or it would be Irish. Because I just want to listen when I think God's talking to me when someone's talking like that, you know? Um, you know, the Alistair Begg thing going on. It doesn't matter what he says. You just want to obey, you know? So I'm listening to Andrew Quigley there. He's in, he's in, he was in Ireland, Scotland, and now he's in Canada. And he's 50 years in ministry. And Richard Caldwell is sitting there with a bunch of us. And he says, you know, Dr. Quigley, could you instruct the young men on how you have a life of enduring ministry. So all of us guys, a bunch of pastors and young seminary students are in there. And Andrew Quigley looks out at us and he says, yes. And it was almost like there was pain in his eyes. I was looking right at him. I had a perfect view. Like the pain of seeing so many people not take the counsel he was about to give to young pastors. And in his, you know, brogue accent, he said to the men, he said, he said to Richard, he said, yes, I'll answer your question, how to have an enduring ministry. And he said, first, he said, men, you need to love Christ, really love Jesus Christ with all your heart. Second, he said, you need to love your wife and love her with all your heart. Third, he said, you need to love your children. And fourth, he said, you need to actually repent of sin in your life. And I was just struck looking at him. And he said, not just talk about sin and not just be convicted over sin would be the idea, but he said, you actually need to identify specific sins in your life and turn from sin to righteousness as a habit of your life. You need to be turning from sin, men. And I thought, man, how often do we sit there and treat sin so casually rather than thinking about what an offense it is to the Lord of glory? Yes, you're saved. Yes, sin's covered, but he was saying, men, are you actually identifying and marking out specific sins and turning from it? I was gripped. I mean, let me illustrate how I thought through it. What if the Lord showed up in one of your prayer times? Right there, sitting with you. And the Lord showed up, and he knew the truth, and you knew the truth. How many times could the Lord say to you, my, my child, my daughter, my son, I've convicted you over that countless times. How many sermon series have you sat over under on that topic? 
How many books do you have to read in that area? I hear your confession, my child, and I forgive you of your sin. I'm the Savior. I forgive sin. This is what Jesus does. Forgive sin. I forgive you. But when are you going to repent of those things that dishonor me? When are you going to actually start turning from the things that I keep convicting you of and you keep confessing? When is there going to be a 180 and you're going to stop doing a 360? Man, we would be undone on our face, dust and ashes, crying out. And you know the first thing we would do? Repent of our shallow repentance. That's what we would do. We would say, Lord, forgive us for having such a shallow approach to dealing with the sin that pinned you to the cross. Forgive us for being so casual about that which triggered the wrath of your father to come down and pour out on you all the wrath and anger of hell's fury on you for our sin. We would be so grieved before the Lord in that moment of how casually we treat that which caused him to be crucified. We need to get over this habit, beloved. So what do we do? How do we turn the corner on this? We'll turn to 2 Corinthians 7 now. If you, if you ever left there, you can stay there. If not, go back. How do we cultivate, in these last few minutes before we take communion here, a better approach to repentance where our, our moments of true conviction and true confession turn into a turning from sin, a, a, a redirecting? 2 Corinthians 7. I'll just spend a few minutes in it here, but I think it'll be helpful to you. You know, Paul had an interesting relationship with Corinth. If you studied it, he wrote four letters to them. Two of them inspired, two aren't. They were a very unrepentant church. They ran Paul out of town. They ran Timothy out of town. They were full of slander and gossip and immorality. They were not a great church. Not exactly your, your hallmark church to follow. And yet Paul loved them and he served them and his heart remained open to them. Well, finally, after much writing and content, and a third letter to them, there is repentance that takes shape in their life. But Paul does not say in this passage, I hear you just confessing. I'm glad you're convicted. No, Paul says, I know your repentance is genuine because I see specific ways you're turning from your sin to righteousness. And he's writing to a church full of believers, by the way. Mostly believers. Some aren't believers. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he's examining them to make sure they're truly saved. But notice what he says there, verse 9, 2 Corinthians 7. Paul says this, I now rejoice. Nothing thrills a pastor's heart more than seeing his people turn from sin, by the way. <laughs> I now rejoice. And by the way, we should be like that in our friendships. When we see people caught in sin and they're turning, there should be a celebration. Not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. Stop there. Notice that here, repentance is broken out from being sorrowful. So being convicted and confessed is broken out from repentance, you could say. Sorrowful is the idea, as I'm going to show you in a moment in this passage, of being grieved over your sin because of how it affects and offends God. To view your sin the way God views your sin. And Paul's about to say, the soil of which true repentance flows out of and the fruit comes out of is godly sorrow. In fact, in this passage, godly sorrow is mentioned five times. Just look at the refrain. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were sorrowful, this godly sorrow, to the point of repentance. Here it is again. For you were made sorrowful, notice, notice, according to the will of God, a will of God sorrow, a sorrow that's in agreement with what God says about your sin. Notice, he goes on, verse 10. For the sorrow, there it is, that's according to the will of God, produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation. But there is a sorrow that's earthly, Saul's sorrow, Esau's sorrow, of the world, it produces death or decay. He's not done, verse 11. For behold, what earnestness this very godly sorrow has produced in you. Stop there. In our doctrine of repentance and our understanding of it, we can look at this passage and say that true repentance, true turning flows out of this Godward sorrow. This Godward sorrow results in, we could say, turning from sin. So what is godly sorrow? Well, notice it's contrasted there with worldly sorrow. Look at the text in verse 10. There's a sorrow that's according to the will of God, produces a repentance without regret. You don't look back and miss your sin. You just want to pursue righteousness, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. How do you, how do you determine the sorrows? Very simply, one is godly sorrow. It is 
vertical, it goes towards God, and one is worldly sorrow, it's horizontal. So it, you could translate it this way. You can be grieved over sin the way the world's grieved over sin, or you can be grieved over sin the way that a Christian's grieved over sin. A Godward sorrow. Literally, you could translate it a God-oriented or a Godward sorrow toward God. So how's the world convicted over sin? They don't like consequences. They don't like shame. They don't like guilt. They don't like the fallout of their sin. They don't like difficulty that comes with sin. But like Saul and like Esau, they're not brokenhearted over what their sin has done to God. They're brokenhearted over how it's affecting them. It's still self-worship. It's just another version. But a Christian, they get concerned about how their sin affects people. They get concerned. They don't like guilt because they know it's a dishonor to God. They know they're guilty. They don't like how their, how their sin spreads out and impacts people's lives. But ultimately, what concerns a Christian in true repentance is what their sin has done to God. It is absolutely a brokenheartedness over how God views my sin. And the whole idea of godly sorrow is getting altitude on your sin and seeing your sin the way God sees your sin. Now think about this. God doesn't see sin in general. God sees specifics. God sees motives. God sees intent. God sees what's behind your eyes. He sees what's in your mind. He sees what's in your heart. Getting a Godward sorrow is actually starting to think about your sin the way God thinks about your sin. If you're a Christian, that's what happened in salvation. You saw your sin and what it was doing to God and what God thought of your sin and you wanted to turn from it because you knew you had dishonored the Lord of glory, that you trampled underfoot the blood of Christ and you clung to Christ for salvation. You had a Godward sorrow and conversion. But we want our life to reflect the same type of repentance that happened in conversion, which means no matter what your sin is, you still want to get a Godward sorrow in altitude that says, what does God say about my sin? What does his word say about my sin? And, and think about it. If you're a Christian and you love the Lord and you're thankful for the gospel of Jesus Christ and you're thankful for forgiven sin, what Christian can meditate on what God thinks of their sin and remain in their seat and remain inactive? If you're a Christian and you think about the heart of God breaking over your sin as he sees it dishonoring him, what happens in a Christian? Godly sorrow is met with a supernatural divine compulsion that says, I want to deal with the sin because I know it dishonors my Lord. Conviction, confession, and then beloved we must take the next steps and go to war with that sin. Take action. And that's what he said he saw in Corinth. Notice, this godly sorrow, Corinth, that I saw in you, this, this unfolding of my grace to help you see your sin, well, Corinth, I know it's shattering your heart, and I know it's, it's conviction, it's confession, and I know it's true repentance, because notice verse 11. For behold, literally look at it, Corinth. You can't miss it. I can see it. You can see it. Uh, Titus just came to town and he saw it. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you. What vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything, Corinth, you proved yourself innocent, holy. You turned from the sin you were living in. What are some of those words, though? Because if we want to think about cultivating godly sorrow under repentance, and I know if you're like me, you get convicted about your convictional, confessional lack of turning. So how do I grow in my turning from sin? Well, let's look at Corinth for a second. Notice verse 11. What earnestness. That's the Greek word spudazo. It literally means to take action quickly. It means to make haste. So, beloved, if you're convicted of an area of sin in your life, do not linger. <laughs> Take action. Turn from the sin. Turn to the word of God. Turn to Christ. Run the other direction from your sin to righteousness. Run to his truth. You'll find his power. Spudazo. Make haste. But then he says that speed in which you turn from sin, it starts to take shape in these other words. Notice that same speed and redirection shows up. Notice the next word. In a vindication of self. That's the word there for apologia. That's the word for making a defense. You may think, what defense does repentance need? Well, a defense of your confession. What Paul is saying is, yes, Corinth, I know you confessed, and I believe it's true because your life is showing evidence that your confession is genuine. Your life defends your confession because your life is actually turning from sin, not just talking about it. 
It's a, an apologia, a turning. And then it's interesting because your life showing up with a transformation and you turning from sin, notice all these other fruits take shape in your relationship with the Lord and what God starts to do in you as you're pursuing true repentance. Notice, what indignation. That's a word there for anger. It's the idea of being righteously angry and hating the sin you were living in. You feel that as a believer. Man, when we sin in some of these areas, we're like, ah, oh, that's the very area I know is a dishonor to the Lord. Well, don't just confess it and talk about it. Turn from it. Go to the word of God. Study what God says about it and apply those truths. Notice, he says fear. Look in the text. What fear? That is to say there's a fresh fear of God. Why would he put fear in repentance? Because all sin is a lack of fear of God, and all moments you obey is an act of fearing God. So when you sin, you're not fearing God. Why? Because the fear of God is the doctrine of you remembering that God's with you in every room. He's sitting next to you in every moment. He's behind your eyeballs. He's in your mind. He's in the next chair. There's nowhere you're at where you escape God. When you fear him, you're looking over and saying, if I commit that sin, you're going to see that, Lord, and I don't want to dishonor you. That's the fear of the Lord. When we sin, we're like practical atheists. I'm just going to act like God's not here and I'm going to do what I want, say what I want, lash out in whatever way I want. He says, in repentance, cultivate a fresh fear of God. I've seen you in Corinth. Fear the Lord in fresh ways. He goes on. Not only a, a vindication of yourself, not only a, a, a hatred for sin, indignation, not only a fresh fear of the Lord, but notice he says there, longing. That's the idea of restoring a relationship with God and others. However far your sin goes, you restore that relationship. Well, we're God's children. We can never lose our salvation, but when we sin, what happens? We fracture the relational unity we have with the Lord. When we pursue him in repentance and confession, we restore that. But also, Paul's talking about other people. Because in this passage, he says these believers long to restore with him. So you might say it this way. True repentance gets tested when you have to go seek forgiveness of the people that your sin affected. Where you go to them and say, brother, sister, forgive me. My sin affected you. And I'm not talking sins of the heart and mind. I'm talking sins of action. And you go seek their forgiveness. I want to restore the relationship where my sin has affected us. Man, that is true repentance. That's repentance getting feet. He goes on. Next word there, zeal. That's the same word we had last week in John 2. Zeal for your house has consumed me. What is he saying? When you're truly broken over your sin, you want God to be honored where you were previously dishonoring him. And so now you're pursuing honoring him where he was dishonored by you. That's the word for zeal. And then look at the last word there avenging of wrong, those three words, it's just one word. It means justice or punishment. In what sense do I need justice or punishment when it comes to repentance? Well, it's actually the idea of taking the consequences. It's you saying, Lord, whatever you want to teach me from this sin, teach me. Let me go to school. Let my consequences be a tutor, Lord. Do the thorough work you need to do so I don't sin in this area anymore. Make it thorough. Let the justice become upon me if you can get more glory. See, false repentance goes, let me manage the outcome. Let me manage reputations. Let me manage what people think. Let me and all of a sudden, it's all worldly sorrow. True repentance says, God, whatever it takes, take me to school. I do not want to sin in this area anymore. I want, I want my repentance to be thorough and genuine. What happens in this, beloved? A, 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 a true turning. Now, not all sins in your life are going to be as big as sins. Not all moments in your life are going to be as manifold in their fruit. But incrementally, the believer's life is a life of turning from sin to the Lord, turning from sin to the gospel, turning from lies to truth. This is what we do, because guess what? We still sin a lot, don't we? Is that a newsflash? Though the righteous fall seven times, the scriptures say, 20, Proverbs 24, 16. They rise again. How do they rise? Repentance. The unloving start working on self-sacrifice. The angry become merciful. The unsubmissive wife starts working on submission. The harsh husband becomes tender and patient. The loose tongue becomes self-controlled. The unmerciful becomes compassionate. The proud start reflecting humility. The sinfully fearful start trusting God. The man-pleaser becomes a God-pleaser. The lazy start working hard. The liar starts truth-telling. The thief stops taking and starts giving. The angry becomes kind. You get it. Repentance is the opposite. And God wants us to live a life of repentance, beloved. Faith and repentance. And guess what? You can't lose your salvation. We do this because it honors him. 
as I said to you in the beginning, from Martin Luther, repentance is not just a one-time action in salvation. Repentance is a way of life because it pleases the Lord when we're holy, beloved. And you know what you find even in your shallow moments of repentance? Mercy. We're going to take communion in a moment and probably all of us should be confessing to the Lord shallow repentance. (laughs) And yet we don't find him up in heaven slapping our hand away as some harsh taskmaster. We find him merciful, patient, kind, tender savior saying, yeah, I already knew that about you. You just got more convicted today and I still love you. So come back to the gospel. Come back to the cross. But the sins that I'm convicting you of, the exhortation I have for you today, beloved, is don't play games with the sins that God is convicting you of. Convict, confess, and turn. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.